our preclinical colleagues have shown that um, uh, that the drug binds to the gingipanes. Um, the, one, of the, one of the key preclinical findings um, is in an animal model. Um, and so um, this is a really uh, a, a key, cause, key piece of evidence for causation too, because um, prior to starting the company, there was some scientific literature showing that um, one of the most uh, common uh, factors you'll see as a high as a risk factor for development of Alzheimer's disease is periodontal disease. Um, not not very intuitively, but they they overlap so that substantially. So we we knew that that was a an overlap. We knew that P. gingivalis was a cause of periodontal disease. So we started we went looking for P. gingivalis in Alzheimer's brains. Um, so so one of the key pieces of data was. Um, work we did with uh, the University of Auckland, which has an excellent brain bank of, of patients who passed away and donated their brains. Um, and so we looked at um, Alzheimer's brains and found the ginger pains in 90 to 100% of the Alzheimer's brains. We also looked in age-matched controls, and it was much lower. This, it was statistically significant at a p-value less than 0. 0.0001. Um, but very interestingly, the Pre, the, the age match controls, some of them had ginger pains, not 95%, but about 30%. Um, and that's exactly consistent with our hypothesis that this infection is upstream from all the other effects. We, we know that there's a lot of pathology in Alzheimer's years, even decades before the cognitive impairment sets in, plaques, tangles, and other things. Um, so if this infection were to be upstream of it, you'd expect it to be in some healthy elderly in the 50 to 80 year old range that, that went on to die for other reasons, a stroke or a heart attack or something like that. Um, so that's exactly what we saw. It's very consistent with the hypothesis. These, these ginger pains, the, the level of the ginger, pain, ginger pains correlate with other biomarkers of Alzheimer's severity, such as tau and ubiquitin. Um, but this doesn't prove causality. It, the, the, the ginger pains are there in the brains of almost all Alzheimer's patients. Um, but a, the next key preclinical study was uh, a mouse model. Um, this, and this is a, a deceptively simple model in which you take regular wild type mice, meaning they have no genetic um, um, modifications, and you take P. gingivalis from humans and you rub it on the teeth and gums of the mice. That, that's the whole model, and then you wait. These are the, uh, on the left, the Alzheimer's brains and the control brains, and above one on that scale is, is positive, below that is basically background noise. So you can see almost all the Alzheimer's brains have P. gingivalis in them, uh, and as I said, a, 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 a minority, but a significant, you know, 30% or so of the controls did too, and this is correlating with tau and ubiquitin. Um, and then in the animal model, uh, and um, this, uh, these major findings in this animal model have now been, um, we've, we've um, generated them, but they've now been replicated at five different independent scientific laboratories. This is some particularly elegant work that was done at the University of Illinois at Chicago. So you just put uh, P. gingivalis on the mouth and in, in the mouth on the teeth and gums of regular mice and you see P. gingivalis infiltrating the brain. You see neuroinflammation with multiple markers. Here's TNF-alpha. You see um, amyloid plaques build up, and um, you see uh, tau tangle-like neurons. Uh, you also see activation of microglia, which are the immune cells of the brain. Uh, and then finally, and perhaps most importantly, you see that um, cell neurons die off in the hippocampus, one of the key memory areas of the brain. So, um, uh, and then we went on to test CORE388 in this model. Um, and he here are the data. Um, the prior slide I showed you was an academic group that treated for 22 months, so they showed really big differences. We were working more quickly here in a drug development timeline, and so we treated for only six weeks with P. gingivalis. Uh, exposed them for uh, the infection for six weeks, and then treated with CORE 388 or tuzogenstat for five more weeks. Um, and you can see that it knocked down the level of the bacteria significantly, and it, and it essentially fully reverses the increase in amyloid, the increase in infectious markers like TNF-alpha, and it essentially 
effectively fully protected against the, the death of the interneurons in the hippocampus. We did a phase one program with a, a standard single ascending dose or SAD study and a multiple ascending dose or MAD study. And um, uh, the key takeaways in phase one are usually re with regard to safety and pharmacokinetics. And, and our safety signal across all these studies was, was very uh, encouraging. Uh, there were, across all the safety measures, there were really uh, no clinically significant findings. Um, on the pharmacokinetics, it's a drug with uh, really nice, what we call drug-like properties. Um, it's well-absorbed. It, it distributes well throughout the body. We know it gets into the brain. Um, and this uh, is roughly linear um, exposure in the blood as, as correlated with dose, what we call linear, linear PK. Uh, within the dose range that we're testing. The half-life is about five hours, consistent with twice daily dosing. Um, but getting to the really more interesting efficacy and biomarker data, um, the, there are, these are a couple of the biomarkers that we looked at in our phase one study. Um, on the left is something called RANTES, or it's also called CCL5, which is an inflammatory biomarker. So again, we expected to see this. We know there's inflammation in Alzheimer's and all sorts of other things that suggest an infection. Um, but we expected that our treatment with patuzogenstat would reduce this. And in fact, we saw about a 30% reduction in only 28 days, uh, and this was statistically significant. Another thing that we know the ginger pains from P. gingivalis do is they cleave certain important proteins like tau and also ApoE which is known to be involved in Alzheimer's. And here we show that, um, uh, we, so we hypothesized since the P. gingivalis gingipane proteases are cleaving ApoE we, and, and making these fragments, we predicted that treatment with core 3D8 or a stat would reduce the number of the small fragments. And again, we saw about a 30% reduction and again, statistically significant. And then the clinical data, these, this is a small study, so it wasn't really designed or powered to see statistical significance on these. Nonetheless, we saw a nice uh, change in the direction of improvement on a standard mini mental state exam uh, assessment. Um, this is a, a computerized cognitive assessment. We also saw a trend in the right direction here. And then this is a really interesting um, uh, company, Winterlight, that's developed an AI-based analysis of speech um, and on measurements of speech that are correlated with decline in Alzheimer's, such as word finding difficulty and, and, and loss of sentence complexity, uh, we saw statistically significant improvements. So all in all, these data in our phase one study were very encouraging and led us to go on to the larger phase two study, phase two, three, potentially pivotal gain trial. You know, we're, we're really excited about this molecule. The, um, um, the, the efficacy we've seen so far, the safety we've seen so far. Um, and not only that, but the convergence of data. I've walked you through some of the data, um, but there are all sorts of other things that this PG hypothesis explains. Now, I'll give you just a couple of uh, uh, um, examples that I think anyone can, it can resonate with anyone. Um, one of the findings out there that everybody who treats Alzheimer's knows about is that a lot of Alzheimer's patients lose their sense of smell. They develop anosmia, sometimes even before they have Alzheimer's. Um, and what we've shown is that uh, in the mouse model, when we have P. gingivalis in their mouth, it goes into the nose and it goes directly into the olfactory nerve and into that part of the brain that controls olfaction. So that's one of those things that's been out there in the literature and not understood well, and our theory explains beautifully. Um, there's a publication that came out before our company was founded that showed that spouses of Alzheimer's patients are at six times as high a risk of getting Alzheimer's as the general population. They speculated in the paper that this might be due to caregiver stress because usually the spouse of the Alzheimer's patient is the caregiver. Um, but I'm a psychiatrist and a psychologist and stress is very important and it does impact things and it can make things 50% worse or something like that it doesn't make things six times worse. However, a very easily um, shared oral infection could easily make something six times harder. So again, our, our theory explains that. So as a scientist, I'm really excited about all the converging evidence 
um, that is really convincing us um, that to be very enthusiastic about uh, the data coming out next quarter.